I'm here to talk about collective intelligence and the notion that we're all better off if we share what we know, if we build on what we know and what others know, and that we're better off if we approach each other with trust and respect rather than with fear and raised fists. And I believe this is more important than it's ever been in human history right now because of the technology and because of the major technological paradigm shift we're in the middle of right now. There haven't been that many technological paradigm shifts. It's a rare event. So the first was the move from foraging to hunting and gathering. It wasn't a clean break. None of these are clean breaks. There's always overlap. Then there was the move from hunting and gathering to horticulture, which means using either a digging stick or a hoe. Then horticulture to agrarian, which means using a heavy animal-drawn plow. Then agrarian to industrial. And now industrial to informational. We're in the midst of the information revolution right now. The world is changing around us. It's a very exciting time to be alive. But what are these changes doing to us? Are we getting smarter or dumber? Are we getting more selfish or more compassionate? The unfortunate answer seems to be we're getting dumber. We're getting more selfish. Our brains are being rewired to accept nothing but instant gratification. I've noticed this in myself. In the last handful of years, I've seen my own attention span shrink in the Wi-Fi years, the YouTube years, the download whatever you want, fast and free years. <laughs> this is not my joke. The Google image search is great. You know, I found this while I was procrastinating writing this piece. In theory, this technology is all good for us. It's bringing us together. Communication channels are more open than they've ever been before. It's easier to stay in touch. It's easier to keep up with what people are doing. It's easier to do research. It's easier to get your ideas out there. But how much online interaction is meaningful? How often does it expand our knowledge? Or more importantly, how often does it expand our circle of care and our compassion? If you would ever like to feel your soul die a little, just read the comments on any YouTube video. <laughs> or, or, even worse, following any article on any widely read website and just track how quickly the ignorance comes out and the intolerance and the racism and the sexism and the homophobia and the accusation that someone is Hitler and worst of all, <laughs> and worst of all, the misspellings, the cutesy abbreviations and the emoticons. <laughs> Very quick word about emoticons. The reason I dislike them so much is because they're a shortcut. They're a substitute for creative expression. If you need a little sideways happy face at the end of a sentence to let me know you're kidding, why not just come up with a more creative combination of words to let me know that you're kidding? <laughs> <laughs> Keynote is so much fun. Uh, and that's the thing. I don't believe that technology is inherently bad. I don't believe any technology is inherently bad. Writing is technology. Language is technology. It's the way you use it. It's the mentality that you have while you're using it that makes all the difference. Although I do believe that technology can prompt us in certain directions towards certain kinds of behavior. And it does seem to me that the internet age is prompting us towards distraction and isolation and arg argumentativeness. So what can we do? What if you were to try to do something about this? What if you were to wait against the tide and see what you could do to brighten the digital landscape and maybe, by extension, the world? Two years ago, Six friends and I co-founded this ideas blog, beamsandstruts.com, a magazine for hungry brains and thirsty souls. And we conceived of this as an experiment in collective intelligence. And I'd like to tell you some of the story about what we did and how it unfolded, because what we were trying to do is create a magazine online that we would like to read and that would offer something to anybody who came to read it. What we ended up doing was creating policies and practices that are all direct challenges to these prompts from the digital age. And anybody can do these things. They're all very simple and they're very basic. Anybody can use these things in their lives, whether they're running a website or not. They're all very simple. So the internet is upping our argumentativeness. It's making us more inclined to verbal sprawling, but it's online and it's anonymous, so it's worse than it's ever been. So what can you do? Well, we instituted a policy of respectful commenting. Doesn't mean you can't disagree with us. You can disagree with us radically, but what is your aim? Are you trying to further the conversation, or are you trying to win? Our world is rife with dualistic thinking. That's something this Catholic priest, Father Richard Rohr, talks about. I'm not even Catholic, and I'm obsessed with this guy. He's a progressive Catholic priest, writer, lecturer, he leads retreats, brilliant guy. Check him out if you get a chance. Fountain of wisdom. And in this one lecture, he talks about how we think dualistically. This is, this is what our reptilian brain wants us to do. It's a survival mechanism. It's necessary. It's not bad in and of itself. We think in dyads, in opposites. Are you for me or are you against me? Are you my friend or are you my enemy? Are you right or are you wrong? And when two people are thinking dualistically, which most of us do most of the time, and they're engaged in a conversation, not even a fight, not even a debate, not even an argument, if they're just having a conversation and they come up with a point of difference, I think this is the case. No, I disagree. I think this is the case. As soon as that happens, the conversation is over. 
because at that moment, each person's ego becomes invested in their opinion. And from that point, to cede an inch means to lose face, and that simply cannot happen. So the inner script is to defend my position no matter what facts are actually being exchanged. But we can evolve past this. If you look at that kind of exchange with any clarity, you can see that's actually a lose-lose proposition, even if one person wins the argument or the discussion. If I trounce you in an argument, I've lost, because I haven't learned anything. All I've done is confirm my own biases and opinions, and I've shamed you, I've made an enemy out of you, and I've guaranteed you will never listen to what I have to say. You'll be even further entrenched in your own opinion. But if I approach the exchange as if we're both on the same side, then somebody who disagrees with me is actually somebody who can teach me something. They can tell me things I never would have thought of. And if they're approaching with the same attitude, then there is no dualistic winning and losing. We're both listening, we're both asking questions, we've both spent at least some time looking at this issue we were emotionally invested in from a new point of view. I actually had an opportunity to try this out this, <laughs> this morning, talking with Grant, who talked about emoticons in his presentation. When I mentioned to him that I had a dig about emoticons in mine, he did not get defensive. He asked questions, and so did I, and we were listening. And he brought up a very interesting point that hadn't, that hadn't occurred to me. Some people's creativity is not verbal. That's a good point. <laughs> now, I'm not quite so sure about that opinion anymore. Anyway, that's non-dual thinking. Uh, the next thing the internet is doing to us is it's upping our isolation. We're more isolated, we're atomized, so it beams and struts. There's seven of us. We thought, what could we do? We can work together. Okay, how? For one thing, we edit each other's articles. We make this policy. Anything any of us wants to publish on the site, we first send it to two other members and get their feedback. Working like this does not come naturally to me. <laughs> I am very individualistic. I always have been. I got good grades in school, but I didn't like being there, doing the same things as everybody else. It was my dream to be an actor. I went to university to study theater, and I didn't like being in plays with other people. <laughs> I didn't like saying other people's lines. I didn't like doing what the director told me to do. I wanted to do my thing my way. And I gravitated towards doing one-man shows. This is what I do now for a living. I stand on stage, kind of like this, and talk about myself for a living. <laughs> and I have no director, I have no collaborator of any kind. There's just me and the audience. I get 100% creative control. So now, when I'm writing something for Beams and Struts, I'll work on it and work on it and work and work and work and work and work until I reach a point where the article is perfect, not even a comma can be changed. And that's when I send it off for notes, purely as a formality. <laughs> there won't be any. It is perfect. And of course, the thing comes back covered in notes and comments and suggestions, and my initial response is always very defensive, because there's that dualistic mind frame. Somebody is threatening the position my ego was invested in. I've learned to recognize this. It's part of my process now. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Doesn't mean it feels any different. I've just learned to notice it. Aha, there goes that reaction again. It's not necessarily me. It's not necessarily right. It's not necessarily wrong. It's just a reaction. Calm down. Observe it. Don't identify with it. Let it go. And then I actually read the notes. <laughs> and then I see the wisdom in it. And then I remember that they're coming from somebody I trust and respect, who trusts and respects me. And then I almost always rewrite the thing with the notes in mind, and I can't believe how much better the new one is than the old one. And all it took was somebody else's point of view to show me something important I could not see on my own. The next thing we also decided to do was start writing on common themes every now and then. It's seven of us, we were all writing on different subjects. What if we wrote about the same subject? So we did a theme week. We all wrote about sports for one week. Another theme week was about community. Most recent theme week was about women. And for that one, we upped the engagement. We met before any of us started writing. We told each other what we planned to write about. The feedback started right away. We shared research. We helped shape each other's drafts at every stage. And we wrote a couple follow-up articles based on comments people left after we published the articles. So the readers became part of the circle of collective intelligence, too. And we gathered together for group writing sessions to help battle the last big bad boogeyman of the internet age, distraction. I'm a writer. I've always battled distraction as well as doubt and procrastination sitting exactly in between me and the thing I would most like to do, writing. And now, the biggest distraction of all is right there on my web browser. There, or right there on my writing apparatus, a web browser. There is so much I would like to say to the world, but the actual act of putting it into words is terrifying. I've been doing this for more than 10 years. It's still terrifying, because looking at that blank screen, I come face to face with my own mediocrity. And the distance between where I am and where I would like to be stares at me. It pokes me. It taunts me. It's a sneering little devil that will not go away. And it's not little. This kind of thing can strangle you. 
It can undermine everything inside you that's of actual value. And there's that web browser singing its siren song of temporary relief in distraction, and there's a thousand and one things I could do instead of sitting down and stealing myself and doing what I know deep down will bring out the best in me and that I'll enjoy doing while I'm doing it and will be very happy to have done after I've done it. <laughs> Why should that be the hard thing to do? <laughs> I don't know, but it is, very consistently. But an interesting thing happens if you get a bunch of people together who all struggle with this same issue, and you all come to the same room, and everybody's got a laptop or a notebook, and you've all got the intention of spending at least two hours writing, what happens is you sit down and write. It's that simple and effective. There's other people there, and you're there for a common purpose. You've created a collective space. You're there for each other. You can bounce around the Twitter sphere. You can have a conversation any other time, but for these two hours, we are here for this purpose because this means something to us, and we are here for each other. One of the members of the group referred to it as literary yoga. <laughs> we do this once a week now, and it's up to our productivity, it's up the quality of our writing, and I can only imagine it's going to keep going in this direction. I do believe in the 10,000 hours theory. So, the bunch of us at Beams and Struts are not unique in this endeavor of putting our heads together for a common purpose. Lots of other people are doing this in all kinds of fields, and anybody can do this. It's so simple and basic. Anybody can get together with like-minded friends or colleagues and say, let's combine efforts. Let's see what the bunch of us can do that we couldn't do on our own. And there's a growing tide of this out there in the digital age, even though there's so much dualistic debating and instant gratification and inauthentic communication, there's also open source software, which builds on collective intelligence and creativity and effort, and people give it away. There's Ubuntu which is an open source operating system for your computer, works on any system at all. And anybody can volunteer and contribute to it, whether they're a computer programmer or not. And it changes someone instantly from a consumer to a creator. There's Wikipedia. There's TED Talks. Let's get together. Let's pool ideas. Let's combine what we know. Let's turn each other on to different stuff, because we're all in this together. I know of four smaller theater companies in Vancouver that deliberately stopped seeing each other as competitors and started seeing each other as collaborators. They pooled resources, they pooled efforts, they built a performance creation lab that they all use, and the art scene of the city is all the richer for it. New Scientist magazine publishes letters from readers on questions about the science of everyday life, science of the obscure. Why is earwax the color it is? Does any animal eat wasps as part of its regular diet? If I wanted to surf down a river of lava, what would the surfboard need to be made out of? Their staff does not know the answers to every one of these questions, so they publish letters from readers who do know the answers to these obscure branches of science. They're tapping the collective intelligence of everybody who reads the magazine. I've taken to using Facebook as a research tool. I use my status updates to ask questions. I pool the people I know for their knowledge and opinions. I test drive ideas I'm working on for articles. How do women feel about being read to? Who's crueler in the world of little kids, boys to boys or girls to girls? Sometimes I'll just ask obscure questions that I'm curious about that you can't find out just by researching in Wikipedia or in the library. How many guys use the flap in the front of their underwear? <laughs> How else would you find this out? <laughs> one person who answered that question, actually. One more than I expected. <laughs> it's a really interesting research tool. I mean, why not take advantage of the fact that I've got instant access to hundreds, if not thousands of people who know things I don't? I'll tell you why. It's because it's humbling. The central myth of our culture, this is something David Simon said, co-creator of The Wire, my favorite TV show. David Simon said the central fairy tale of our culture is the transcendent individual. I've always wanted to be the transcendent individual. It flatters my ego to see myself as the kind of person who's above taking other people's suggestions, who already knows what's going on. There's a lot to be gained from overcoming that knee-jerk ego reaction. Pretty much all the references I've made in this talk, Father Richard Rohr, The Wire, uh, the different technological epochs of human history. I got that from the writings of philosopher Ken Wilber. The books of Barbara Ehrenreich, who I'll quote in a minute. These things all came to me from other people, and I resisted them all at first. And then I relaxed and let them come into my life, and they enriched my life immeasurably. I know about Ubuntu, the open source operating system for your computer, because my dad volunteers for them in his retirement. And at Beams and Struts, we did a theme week on the subject of community, which was not my idea. I believe I used the word repugnant to describe my reaction to that. And then I let that reaction pass, and I thought, this is being suggested by people I trust and respect. Maybe I'll learn something. It'll take me out of my regular thought patterns. I remember my dad volunteered for Ubuntu. He put me in touch with an Ubuntu rep. I interviewed him, and he was fascinating and told me about the sense of community and empowerment that comes from people contributing to something that's bigger than themselves that benefits everyone, which is something I believe I've always known. I think that's something most of us know deep down. It's something Barbara Ehrenreich, one of my favorite writers, journalist, author, 
awesome person, wrote in this book, Dancing in the Streets, A History of Collective Joy. She talks about how moving and chanting in unison was probably our first step forward as a species. It was a way to fend off predators. It made us look bigger than we are individually. And it was also a way to form a sense of common purpose and responsibility and care and even ecstasy. We need more of that feeling these days because there's seven billion plus of us on the planet and the internet age is prompting us towards distraction and argumentativeness and isolation. And it feels like there's a tug of war going on for the future. On the one hand, it's like we're headed straight for a massive collapse. Could even happen within our lifetime. Our rate of pollution is unsustainable. We're extracting non-renewable resources from the Earth as fast as we can, and who cares about the damage? A lot of the items we in the first world believe we simply cannot live without come from third world sweatshops that don't pay a living wage and have horrible human rights records. And we know this, but we want cheap stuff. A lot of our food comes from factory farms and factory ships and monocrop agribusiness. It's loaded with GMOs. It's shipped across the country or across the world, leaving a huge carbon footprint. And then it's processed and loaded with additives and preservatives, and it's fattening, and it's addictive. And we know this. But we want cheap food, especially cheap food that gives us that jolt. The gap between the rich and the poor is widening. Our political discourse, so much of the time, is nothing but partisan bickering, no one listening, no one giving an inch. A lot of us are clinging to fundamentalist, science-denying interpretations of religion because the world is changing, and it's changing fast, and we're scared. And we want an, an omnipotent authority to tell us we are in the right, and everything's going to be OK, and our group is going to win. But that's not necessarily the case. And on the other hand, there's more people than ever willing to look at the world from different points of view. In fact, who do this as part of their regular life every day and don't even think of it. More people than ever willing to work as a team, even with strangers. More people willing to share, even with strangers. More people who don't just value the success and survival of me or my group, but of everyone and everything on the planet. Every display of altruism counts. If you're just thinking, if you're thinking I'm just one person, or me and my friends are eight people, what, what can we do? Don't let yourself off the hook. Every act of cooperation and collaboration counts. Every display of selflessness and generosity counts. Every time someone lets their ego reaction pass and chooses to act a different way counts. Every time someone reaches out to someone who might have been thought of as an adversary counts. Every time someone switches from a passive consumer to an active contributor counts. There are ways to make the tools the internet age has given us propel us to greater creativity and productivity and empathy. We can choose to put our heads together and build on what we know and what others know. And every time any one of us does this, it's another set of hands on the rope in the tug of war pulling us towards survival and a new way of living where we all consider ourselves to be on the same side. I started off this talk saying that we're in the midst of a major technological paradigm shift, and we are. And it's a rare event, which makes this an exciting time to be alive. But this particular paradigm shift is different. And the way that it's different makes it possibly the most exciting time to be alive there's ever been in human history. Because with this particular technological paradigm shift, every single one of us has the opportunity to participate in the way it's going to unfold. So what are we going to do? And what are you going to do? Thank you very much.